Howdy historians, how you doing? Mr. Montgomery here, getting ready to bring you a flipped lesson for Unit 1, Part 1. So you are on your first flip lesson of the year here, a little tool we'll use every now and then to move through lessons more effectively. You do some of the information acquisition at home, and then we come back and talk about it in class. So today we're in Unit 1, Pre-Columbian Societies, Settlement of the Americas, and the beginning of Colonial America, 1491. 1607 is where the majority of the information that we're going to talk about is going to fall. But you'll see some of the stuff comes before that. Just a couple little things come after. But that's the center of our discussion. So that's the big unit title. The smaller title, the area that we're going to be talking about today, is part one of the unit, which is America before European contact. So we can see that Buffalo are going to be important. This is a Spanish conquistador's drawing of the city of Tenochtitlan, the Aztec capital, these are the Incans, the Inca, excuse me, in some potatoes, and here we've got the Aztec with some human sacrifices, nothing will freak out a monotheistic Catholic Spanish conquistador like seeing human sacrifice, because it would have been terrifying, we'll talk about that more as we move through the unit. Now, if you hop over to your lecture outline, which you got in class the other day, what we are looking at is this area right here. So we're in part one, American before European contact. You can see the key concept from the uh, AP College Board that we're going to be looking at. And you can see our two big headings, American cultures and American Indian empires. So we're just getting a little brief look here about what some of the American cultures are and the food that defines them. And then we're looking at some of the empires and the common characteristics that they share. So this lecture outline will help you stay organized. It will also really help take better notes. The lecture outline links up with my lecture notes and all of that is reflected on the headings and everything in my smart presentations. So get to know, learn, and love those lecture outlines so that way you can keep really good notes and understand the material better. Organization is key, ladies. So without further ado, let's get into it and start to look at American cultures. Now, we're not going to get into a deep look here about the uh, you know, personal relationships or religious practices cultures. Instead, we just want to understand where these cultures got their start and then what was the, the driving factor for their cultural development. Hint, it's food, which is why there's a lot of pictures of food on the bottom. Now, the first settlers from the Americas came over on the Barents Sea Land Bridge. You can see the Barents Sea Land Bridge is up here. It's a bridge made of ice that temporarily connected North America and the Eurasian continent, specifically uh, northeast portion of Asia is connected to the northwest portion of North America. So these areas are now going to be connected together by ice. And this is where the first settlers came over during the last ice age, probably about 25,000 years ago. They were small bands of nomadic, nomadic hunters from Southeast Asia. They come over during the ice age. The ice age ends and these small bands of uh, nomadic hunters are now stranded on the continent because the land bridge isn't there anymore when the Ice Age ends. So over thousands of years, they slowly populate the Americas, spreading across the continents, literally all the way from modern-day Alaska, all the way down to the very tip of South America and everywhere in between. Now, their populations remained relatively small. V uh, the estimates vary, but by the time Europeans arrived in 1492, there's probably about 50 million people. Uh, living in the Americas. And I use kind of a middle of the road estimation. You can find some that are smaller, some that are much larger. 50 million is a good kind of uh, middle ground for the estimate of how many people are probably in the Americas. So the first settlers come over on the Barents Sea land bridge. Now, they have to figure out a food source, and that's where corn comes in. The importance of corn in the development of the Americas cannot be overstated. It's like wheat and cereal grains in and the domestication of animals in Europe. It drove civilizational, civilizational development. If you had corn, you could have a large population with a complex society. When you look at some of the most advanced societies, the Incas in Peru, the Mayans in Central America, the Aztecs in modern-day Mexico, um, the Pueblo or the Iroquois Confederacy, all of them were good farmers. Most of them also had corn, because if you have more food, you can have more people, can have more complex societies. So corn drove societal development. It was the foundation for large and stable societies in the Americas because once your food source is secured, you can focus your attention elsewhere. So corn is the foundation. Corn transforms nomads into permanent settlements filled with permanent settlers. Corn cultivation didn't reach all of the Americas. 
it was really defined, uh, confined to certain pockets in certain areas. But where you had corn, you could have development of civilizations. Uh, it started in the northern Islands of Mexico. That's where the first corn uh, was cultivated. Uh, it was called maize there, M-A-I-Z-E, -E, maize or corn, same thing. But around 5000 BC, hunter-gatherers in the northern highlands of Mexico start to cultivate maize. It spread into southwest in the southwest United States and throughout Central America, and it will have some other pockets uh, along the Mississippi River Valley and the uh, eastern seaboard of North America as well. So it was a transformer. It was a transformative aspect of society. Corn allowed American cultures to develop. Right? That's how it all ties together here. So, corn, muy importante. If you have the corn, you can have a society and a civilization because you don't think about anything until you secure your food source. Right? It's like your last class before lunch. You're not thinking about whatever the teacher's talking about. You're thinking about what part of your lunch you're going to eat first. Right? You've got to have your food before you can think of everything else. Now, if you didn't establish corn, or like the, the Incas had potatoes, if you didn't have a stable food source that you were growing through agricultural processes, then you're going to be semi-nomadic or nomadic. Semi-nomadic groups are primarily going to be hunters that are hunting one or a couple large herds of animals that allow them to have a summer camp and a winter camp. That's why we have the picture of the American bison, the buffalo here. Because lots of groups in the Great Plains of the United States hunted the buffalo. So they'd have a summer camp where the women and the children and the younger uh, people of society or the very old people of society was set up. The men would go out on very long hunting expeditions. The women would stay back and gather things and look over the society and the culture. Or I should say the society and the civilization, excuse me. So you had migratory hunting. They were semi-nomadic. They're going to have a winter camp near fresh water, usually a river that is moving not going to ice over, and then they're going to have their summer camp where they can access these large animals that they're going to be able to hunt. Okay, So they're not going to be as complex. They're not going to be as large as the agricultural groups that are farming corn or potatoes because the populations just are small. You can't have as many people if you don't have as much food. So when you're following your migratory game and you're moving around with different weather and different seasons, populations remain relatively small. The level of sophistication and development of the societies remains relatively small, and these populations are going to be relatively spread out too. So they don't develop into large, complex city-states. They stay in small, uh, relatively undeveloped, semi-nomadic groups that made the continent ripe for picking by Europeans. Most of the populations of North America were semi-nomadic or nomadic when Europeans start to arrive in the 14 and 15 and 1600s. So Europeans, dense populations, lots of people, lots of military technology. North American small populations, not a lot of density, very little military technology. The clash was starting to establish itself before anyone even bumped into each other. Uh, the clash of cultures that would occur so if you don't have corn, semi-nomadic. And then there are some straight nomadic groups too. One other uh, form of agriculture that led to some societal development is called Three Sister Farming. You saw this a lot along the Atlantic seaboard, the east coast of the United States. This is where civilizations would grow corn, beans, and squash all together. So the corn stalk serves as a trellis for the beans that grow up the corn, and then you grow squash in the rows in between uh, the you to triple your food output. So this allowed to some larger population densities. We couldn't say they were extremely dense populations, but they allowed for larger populations than if you were semi-nomadic, if you figured out three sister farming. So again, these were groups along the Atlantic seaboard of the United States, the east coast of the United States. Groups like the Creek, the Choctaw, the Cherokee, the Wampanoag, the Pequot, and the Iroquois were three sister farmers with semi-complex civilizations. You know, and that word complex has a lot of different definitions, but we're really talking about complex in uh, relation to European complexity of government, religion, and military technology. We'll talk a lot more about that later. So, Cultures expand with the expansion of food. Now, who are some of these groups? What are some of these cultures? Who are some of these civilizations? Well, the first group we're going to look at are those civilizations in Mesoamerica. Really, we're talking about Central America here. Some of the most well-known groups, like the Mayans, the Aztec, the Inca. The characteristics that they share in common, of course, they're going to be farmers. For the groups like the Aztec and the Mayan in Central America, it's going to be corn, 
for groups like the Inca in South America, it's going to be potatoes. If you're a good farmer, you've also got to have a good calendar so you know when to plant and when to harvest. If you're a good, uh, if you have a calendar, you're also going to be good at astronomical observation. That's what your calendar is going to be based off of. If you're good at astronomy, you're good at math, right? So all those things go in hand. Farming, calendars, astronomical observations, astronomy, and advanced mathematics. These groups were also known to have incredibly complex governments and in complex religions. Their governments were very war-driven. It was a lot about conquest and conquering your neighbors, just like the history of Europe war-driven societies about conquest. The religion was different though, uh, American versus European. American religions were polytheistic and many of them involved human sacrifice, which really scared people and makes a lot of sense why you, it would. Right? That'd be pretty terrifying to see. So those are some of the common characteristics of the civilizations of Mesoamerica. We'll come back and take a look at the Aztec and the Inca in more detail in part two of the unit. When we're in North America and we're looking at some of the common characteristics of those civilizations, they're different. In general, North American civilizations are more spread out. You had some large-scale corn cultivation in the uh, modern west of the United States. We're talking, you know, uh, like Arizona, California, New Mexico, Utah, Colorado. There was some corn cultivation there with the Pueblo and the Anasazi. There was some uh, corn cultivation along the Mississippi River. There was some three sister farming. But overall, North American uh, empires didn't really exist. They were overall pretty spread out. But their common characteristics were also different and unique. One thing that was different is that North American civilizations were primarily, primarily matrilineal cultures. Matrilineal. That means possessions and power flow down the maternal, the mother's side of the family. European uh, society was patrilineal, male, father-driven. The reason why women were in charge and, and um, civilizations were matrilineal in North America is because women would stay back and tend to the fields while men went out and hunted. Whether they were in settled groups or semi-nomadic groups, the women held the power because they stayed back and they were there to make decisions while the men went off in these very long hunting expeditions. Not a couple days, not a week, like maybe Someone in your family knows. I'm talking these guys can be gone for multiple weeks, even a month, as they go on these very large-scale and long hunting expeditions. So the cultures of North America are matrilineal. They're female-driven. That's going to be a huge culture clash when Europeans and Americans start to interact with one another. North American cultures also had a very balanced relationship with nature. They didn't aggressively manipulate nature like European cultures did. Um, then... There's some more specific characteristics. In the southwest portion of the United States, corn is really important. Corn made its way from the highlands of North Mexico into the southwest United States around 2000 BC. So we saw groups like the Pueblo and the Anasazi who were able to develop large and complex and sophisticated societies. Complex irrigation systems, great farming good calendars, good math, good uh, uh, astronomy. So they were able to have more complexity than other areas because they had farming of corn on a scale that other areas weren't able to match. We also saw some development along the Mississippi River Valley. These groups were typically semi-nomadic. There was some corn cultivation, but not everybody used it. So they were semi-nomadic groups. There was a large city named uh, called Cahokia modern-day St. Louis, that probably was home to about 25,000 people when Columbus arrived and was a big trading outpost. And in the Northeast, you had groups like the Iroquois and the Iroquois Confederacy that were able to have some larger-scale development. But the development we saw overall in the Americas was different than the development we saw in Europe. And as we oh, skip that for a minute, wrap up kind of the big picture here. There's, there's really a few things we want to talk about. One, everything's pretty small. Everything's pretty spread out in the Americas. Uh, also, the, the path of development that the Americas are on are very different, is very different than the path of development that European countries are on. And we're going to come back and talk about that tomorrow, that this idea of development, this idea of what is civilized. Let me fix that. <laughs> there we go. Civilized is very different depending on who you ask. Everything's different. Everything's spread out. Everything's small. Really what we're seeing here, and again, of course, more tomorrow, is that 
North America is ripe for the picking, and there's going to be this huge clash of cultures. Take some notes.